oh, being a black person from Nigeria, my degree is not recognized here in the UK. This is all I'm going to have the chance to do. Mm. Be a security guard or a bouncer or work in the care industry. But this is the threshold. It's not going to go beyond this. And this is going to have to be your life. And I came to terms with that slightly quickly. I just felt, you know what? It's not about the money. My kids are happy. You know, the wife's happy. We have a nice big TV <laughs> and the fridge. It's got grocery in it. And every now and again, we can hit the Nando's. Mm. I think we're fine. Conditioning. Yeah. Yes. So I just felt like, ah, let's, let's just get on. Let's not moan too much. Life, life's okay, man. Yeah. Let's leave it. And I think that's, you know, that's, that's something sometimes that we have to be very, very careful of because you become comfortable with that situation because, it's the, you know, the mind is designed to keep us safe, right? It's incredible, So yeah. if, if this thing is hurting you, you know, being in this position, then the mind starts to slowly condition you. Say, oh, totally. Actually, is it, is it really that bad? Totally, yeah. you know? Totally. I mean, when I go to church on Sunday and I put on a nice three-piece suit, you know, with some pointy shoes, mm. and I say to myself, come on, like, <laughs> it's okay. You know, like it's not so bad, mm. you know, and, and then you take, you, you know, you take a photograph, you look back and like, yeah, it's fine. Mm. But it's really not fine mm. because you can do way more than you do. Welcome to this episode of the Need to Succeed podcast. And as I always say, really what this podcast is all about is where we bring on phenomenal guests, you know, really successful people in the field who've gone on to achieve incredible things. And really what it's all about is oftentimes what happens in life is two people can go through the exact same situation. And one person decides because of this situation, they are going to go ahead and become wildly successful while the other person because of the same situation, doesn't actually then go on to achieve the success that they might want in their life. Now, the question is, what is the difference between these two people? What is the mindset? How do they process the same sort of information to go ahead to actually achieve the, achieve the success that they want in their life? And that is exactly the question that we look to answer on this podcast. And today, we have got an absolutely incredible guest. We have got a phenomenal journalist, someone who has just recently been nominated for the Gryson Awards. Now, if you don't know what the Gryson Award is, this is the Oscars for journalists. And it's also an Emmy-nominated senior journalist for the BBC World Service. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Mr. Bolahan Peter Macjob. <laughs> <laughs> what, what an intro. Yeah, did you uh, enjoy that? I, I, did. I, I actually really enjoyed that uh, myself. <laughs> I felt like I was coming to the boxing ring. <laughs> Thank you. Fantastic. Um, Mr. Mac Job, it's an absolute pleasure to have you on here. Thank you so much. And what I would like to do, actually, first of all, before we start, is actually just give you a lot of honor and a lot of praise. You know, because trying to get you on here today really, really meant um, a lot to myself. And I just wanted to thank you for how graceful you have been with your time. And on top of that, you know, first of all, for actually accepting to come on here. But then secondly, it's not been the smoothest ride, right? We've had to keep changing times and changing times again. And that's been on my side. But every time you've just been gracious and said, not a problem, but let's just make it happen. So I just wanted to honor you for that. So thank you very much for that. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Brilliant. I just felt like uh, we need to meet each other halfway and make this happen because I want to be on this show as well. Oh. Brilliant stuff. Thank you so much. And it's a pleasure to have you on. Thank you. Okay, so let's get started. Now, we have got a tradition on the podcast. And the very first question, look, it's called the need to succeed. All right? So the very first question I've got for you is, what does success actually mean to you? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's interesting because it's relative, isn't it? I think for me, when I think about it now, for me, success will be being in a situation where I have nothing that keeps me up at night mm. being able to find myself in a situation where whatever is going on i can sort it i can fix it i have the capacity to address it whether it's money i can pay or you know whatever it is going to cost me i can make it happen whether it's time i can get it whether it's family i can do it 
just being in a situation where I'm able to control everything around me that affects me, that other people are not in control of my life, that for me would be being successful. Absolutely. Well, what well, 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 great answer, really. And I can completely relate to that, you know, definitely relate to that because it's it's really about having that, well, for me as well, it's about having, having that autonomy of decisions. Yeah, because you can have money, you could have multiple things mm -hmm. and you're, you're chasing things, you mm -hmm. know. So I've, I've been in a situation where I'm chasing. I feel like I'm being chased. Mm. And I feel like when you get to a point where there's zen, I feel like that's, that for me, that would be ultimate success. Amazing. And I'm, I'm trying my best to get there on a regular basis. Brilliant yeah. stuff. Brilliant. Yeah, but I'm good right now. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. That's great to hear. Great to hear. So, you know, you've spoken about what, what I'd really like to do is unpack, you know, your journey so far, you know, because what you've gone on to, you know, to achieve is absolutely phenomenal. And what, you know, I know, for example, what we've been speaking about, you know, just before jumping on here and all of these things that you're also going to go on to achieve as well are just phenomenal. Which I'm not going to say on camera. Yeah, <laughs> that's perfectly fine. Well, by the end of it, who knows? Who knows what you might slip in there? <laughs> um, but what I'd really like to do is to go through your journey because that's what this is all about, right? Going through your journey and unpacking those gems and just get to understand you a little bit more and learn those lessons from your journey. So just, you know, First of all, before you become a journalist, right, you know, how did you actually come to become a journalist? Well, I've been a journalist since I was in Nigeria before I came here. Mm -hmm. I studied journalism in a small town called Abeokuta, you know. I'd always wanted to be a journalist because my sister uh, studied journalism and she's, she's got like six, seven, eight years over me. And I used to help her with a project. So if you wanted to do advertisement and she needed sound bites, I would bark like a dog <laughs> for her. I would mew like a cat. I would make n noises because, you know, I was quite playful. So I felt like, how can this be school? This is so much fun. Mm. So, yeah, early on, I've always wanted to be a journalist. And I consume a lot of content as a, as a kid. You could argue that television raised me. I watch everything, news, cartoons, documentaries, current everything. So I'd always been attracted to content making, being on telly, uh, news, current affairs, documentaries, films. So when it was time to make that decision as to what I was going to study, it was mm. easy. Even though I, I tried the sciences, but I've always knew that that wasn't for me. But as soon as I got into the arts, I knew journalism was going to be my thing. So I've been a journalist from when I was in Nigeria. I worked for the, Ni for the uh, government of Nigeria as a yeah. press officer. Um, and then... When I came to the UK, I did try to carry through, but yeah. uh, I couldn't go into journalism. Obviously, the, the degree from Nigeria is not necessarily recognized here, mm. plus some other challenges. So I just left it, and life happened to me. Wow. You know, yeah. Wow. I mean, that's, um, you know, being from, you know, what, similar backgrounds. I'm, I'm also Nigerian myself as well, born in Nigeria, moved over here to the UK. Mm. Um, I didn't quite have, you know, similar struggles because I was only, you know, young when I came over to the UK. But I know my mom similarly had, yeah. you know, those issues of, you know, you're highly qualified yeah. back home. Yeah. All of a sudden you come here and it's as if you're starting from scratch again. It's, those it's, qualifications. It's, men it's mental. I, I felt like life hit me on the face with a massive elbow. It, because it was shocking. It was totally discombobulating. Mm -hmm. So when I was in Nigeria, I, uh, I was a press officer. And basically, you speak for the government, whatever they're doing. You know, like the minister in Nigeria, Mr. Lai Mohammed, everybody you talking mean about... You Lion Mohammed? No, Lai Mohammed. <laughs> <laughs> That'll have to be off record. Yeah. So basically, that was our job. You know, we would look around what the governor was doing and we'd put it in paper and write to media organizations. So I loved it. And I was like really young as well. I felt like, yeah, this is the life I want to live. I had mm. like a nice car, nice young family. So moving here and life happening to me, I feel like, it gave me a massive elbow across the face because now I had to have a job as a security guard uh, in the club, you know, freezing outside, shaking like a jelly and having people disrespect me because I'm just tall and skinny and people be like, get out of my way, you know. So it wasn't nice for me mentally and it kind of upset me and I felt like I stalled in my journey of life and I spent a lot of time being resentful as to how did I end up here and why am I all of a sudden looking like a deadbeat uh, 
like dad for my kids, for instance. Um, what do you mean? Well, just not being able to do what you feel you should do for your children, like going on a nice holiday mm. or being able to buy things, maybe like a game console when your nine-year-old son asks for it, for it and having to wait maybe to the end of the month or having to save up to do that. Mm. And I remember it used to hurt my feelings when my son asked me for something and I didn't have it and how it was almost becoming a habit of not having money when you need it. Mm. You know, it was so unsettling. Like, why would I not have cash when I need it, when I'm working? You know, but then what are these jobs that you're doing anyway? So if I felt trapped for a while in a little box because I felt like, oh, being a black person from Nigeria, my degree is not recognized here in the UK. This is all I'm going to have the chance to do. Mm. Be a security guard or a bouncer or work in the care industry. But this is the threshold. It's not going to go beyond this. And this is going to have to be your life. And I came to terms with that slightly quickly. I just felt, you know what? It's not about the money. My kids are happy. You know, the wife's happy. We have a nice big TV. <laughs> and the fridge has got grocery in it. And every now and again, we can hit the Nando's. Mm. I think we're fine. Conditioning. Yeah. Yes. So I just felt like, ah, let's, let's just get on. Let's not moan too much. Life, life's okay, man. Yeah. Let's leave it. And I think that's, you know, that's, that's something sometimes that we have to be very, very careful of because you become comfortable with that situation because, it's the, you know, the mind is designed to keep us safe, right? It's incredible, So yeah. if, if this thing is hurting you, you know, being in this position, then the mind starts to slowly condition you. Yeah, totally. Actually, is it, is it really that bad? Totally, yeah. you know? Totally. I mean, when I go to church on Sunday and I put on a nice three-piece suit, you know, with some pointy shoes. Mm. And I said to myself, come on. Like, <laughs> it's okay. You know, like, it's not so bad. Mm. You know, and, and then you take, you, you know, you take a photograph. You look back and I'm like, yeah, it's fine. Mm. But it's really not fine. Mm. Because you can do way more than you're doing. But then the question is, how do you make that transition? Mm. And for me, that was the massive learning curve when I eventually made that transition. Mm. You know, everything happened between your ears, where you felt like enough, you know, because I felt my soul was at war with me. Mm. Just what I mean. Can you explain that? What do you mean? So on the outside, everything was great. Mm. But on the inside, I felt like I was doing myself a disservice. Everything that's happening now, being a BBC journalist, being nominated for the, for, for the, for the uh, Emmys and Grison, and being commissioned to travel, to go make films. I've had that vision ever since I was a kid, as wow. a teenager. It's been my thing. I've always felt that's what I'm made for. Mm. Like, I'm not supposed to be uh, average. Mm. Just what I mean. Because uh, when I was young, I played basketball. I played the piano. Mm. I was in the debating club. I tried to be an actor. So I've always felt like I need to do more. Mm. That that's what I'm cut out for, to be out there and try to make things happen. But to be the guy that's home and going to work and some dead-end job, coming home with some average salary, mm. having very little once all the bills have, have been paid, and then counting down to another payday. Mm. I've always felt that that was not the life I was supposed to live. Do you know what I mean? And then So it's like, where are the options? Crime? Absolutely not. You know, because there's no chance I'm going to risk going to prison. So I'm thinking I'm not even about to entertain such thoughts. My problem is what, the, what am I going to do? Because I don't see what else I can do. This is all I have. And it looks like this is going to be it. Can I just um, get on with it? Watch my children blossom? Mm. You know, and my kids were like happy anyway. So I just thought, let's just rein ourselves in here. Let's not drink our own Kool-Aid. Mm. Who told you you're, you're special? Mm. Do you know what I mean? Who told you that you're wow. supposed to do exploits? Come on now. Wow. Come off your own uh, uh, hype. Look around you. Do you know what I mean? How did that make you feel? It speaks to the fact that my soul and myself were in conflict. Mm. Because when I go to bed, I, I feel like I'm doing myself a disservice. I feel like I can do way more than I'm doing right now. I know it in my heart and soul that if I can just find how I need to turn the corner and get on this 
journey I could really take off as a journalist, maybe as an actor, you know, or a business person, or maybe I need to. I just felt like, dude, you can do more than being the security guard or a bouncer mm. or working in the care home. You can do way more than that. Of course you can. But the question is, so how and when? You know, and that's, that was the problem I had for a long time because I didn't know how to do it. But there was a moment I had a job and uh, it was like a moment when, you know, when they talk about this, the camel's back breaking, you know, that the final straw. straw. That the camel's back, yeah. So I had this job. Obviously, I'm going to protect them. And I'd always been uncomfortable and unhappy about the way the job was being done because we're supposed to look after uh, people with special needs. And special needs is something that's dear to my heart for family reasons. So it wasn't just a job. It was also some sort of vocation, you know. And uh, I would see the way these colleagues of mine would treat some of these people. And it would bother me because that could be my family member, which is what I mean. Mm. So, so I, I was like that angry black person, you know. I was always agitated and mm. I was always complaining. Like, don't do this, don't do that. You're not supposed to do this. You're, don't tell me what to do. You know, always like, you know, having that moment. Yeah. And I just felt it within my soul. I can't do this anymore. You know, so I started to try to look for alternatives. And I would go to events, like property events, like conferences or seminars. I would pay, mm. you know, scarce resources. And I'll sit down. I'll count the amount of people that's there. Like, there could be a hundred of us. And in my mind, I'm thinking, so 100 of us have paid on 50 pounds to be here. And this man speaking, I'll be listening, like, no disrespect, but I can do that. <laughs> do you know, like, I can do that. But is this, is this going to be the way to do it or what's going on? Mm. So in the process of attending those functions, I had one event that I attended and um, it was like, like a youth forum. Uh, this, this gentleman ran like a, a charity of sort, where it will champion black courses. So Black History Month, art exhibition, uh, youth training, all sorts of stuff. And he was getting grants and funding from the government. So he got me involved in some of those projects to you know, learn how to do it and then lead some of the sessions. But again, I've always felt like that's my calling anyway, mm. you know, be in the forefront and make things happen because mm. I have people skills, I think. So we would do this project. It would be a huge success. Then I will realize that this gentleman has been paid some good money by the sponsors to make this thing happen. So I said, right, that's it. I'm going to set up my own organization. Mm. I'm going to do exactly what this fellow is making me do this time for myself. And that's exactly what I did. So I quit my job on the spot. Initially, I wanted to carry on doing the job while I was chasing this hustle. But one thing I've learned is you have to back yourself. You really have to. Because if you don't trust yourself mm -hmm. and you cannot vouch for yourself, you have no moral justification to ask anybody to vouch for you mm -hmm. or ask anybody to pay you more money or give you opportunities when you're not even about to give yourself opportunities. Yeah, but, you know, I've got, I've got kids to feed. Exactly, yeah. So, like, yeah. it's not easy to make that decision. Yeah, I know. You've heard people talk about burning the bridge. Because mm -hmm. when you do that, there's no going back. Mm. And I realize as reckless as that sounds, sometimes that's, that's the only way. Because while you have a, a comfort zone, it's derogative. There's no growth in comfort. And as, as bad as that sounds is, is the fact. Because when you're comfortable, I mean, you look at all this... Let's go into like the pugilist sports, boxing. Mm. You will hear them talk about they lose the moment they got comfy. Mm -hmm. You can mention names. Silk sheets. They're there. <laughs> yeah. He said it's hard to wake up at six in the morning mm -hmm. from a nice bed with silk <laughs> sheets. I'm sorry. And once you're comfy, it's hard. So you really have to stay hungry, you know. But for me, you need to put yourself in a situation where there's no going back. So for me, I already knew that I was done with that job because it was killing my soul. The sort of things I had to do to collect my salary, mm. it was bothering me. Not because I was above it. I felt like I could do way more, but also I felt like I was doing myself as a human being. Again, I refer to the soul. I felt like I was doing my soul a disservice, mm. that my soul was not happy for where I have taken it. Like, 
This is not how I made you. Why are you here when you could be there? Why did that why did that bother you so much though? Because, you know, there's so many other people who've been through, you know, similar things to yourself and now 20, 30, 40 years down the line, still in that same situation. Why why you know why 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 did they bother you that much? You know, and I probably don't have any answer to, answer for it except maybe when I look at my situation now and to think that if I hadn't made moves, mm. how I would have lost the opportunities that I have now. Mm. How I would never have been in the situation that I am now. I mean, I, I got here super late, mm. super, super late because I was asking myself multiple questions about maybe it's not a real thing. Maybe I just need to manage my expectations. But I've always felt in my soul that there's something there for me. And now more than ever, I'm sure that there is because I have evidence. Mm. You know, you can argue with results. Mm. Every time I've ventured out, I've gotten the reward. Mm. So now I cannot not venture. Mm. So right now, life is good. But when I think about the dreams that I have and the things I'm trying to achieve, my heart, my, my heart starts to race because I'm super excited. Do you see what I mean? I want to, I wanna, um, yes, I completely understand. I want to... Um, I want to push back on something a little bit, right? You've got a dream and you've got this vision and you have to conceive it to actually achieve it. But a lot of people have dreams and then nothing happens. There's a reason for that. I've learned from my experience that there's opportunities everywhere on a regular basis. But you need what you call like inner eye or spiritual eye to see them. I promise you. And I feel like it's not even voodoo is science so if you want something so much and you become obsessed by it that it dominates your life not in a negative way so you wake up in the morning that's what's on your mind you go to bed that's what's on your mind i think what happens is your spiritual life becomes open such that when your moment comes you see it mm. that's how it happens and that's why it's always happened to me so whenever i have something that i like when my moment comes i would know Absolutely. Yeah, because that's all I'm thinking about. Yes. And even when you look at other parts of life, you know, when I usually use sports as an example a lot. Some of the greatest, the, the, the method is the same. There's mm -hmm. nothing different. Mm -hmm. They're so obsessed with the sport that they do. Absolutely. Michael Jordan, LeBron James, Kobe, or blessed memory. Same old story, mm -hmm. same thing. They come to the gym first, they leave last. Mm -hmm. You know, they're obsessed. And then when they're done with the sport, then they start to put attention on their body, mm. what they eat, what they know, what, you know, come on. So I feel like if we put that kind of obsession into what we do for a living, you know, so me being a journalist now, becoming obsessed with my journalism, you know. Absolutely. And the, the reason I wanted to, you know, the reason I asked that question uh, w w was because, yes, Sometimes it's so easy for, because you know, there's a lot of just sit there and meditate and, you know, just dreaming is actually going to happen. But what you've used is the word obsessed. You have the dream, it consumes you, you become obsessed with it, which that means you can't but take action. Because that's totally. the missing piece, right? You can't just dream and then it happens. The bridge between your dream and the reality is that action. Because once you become obsessed by it, every single day, Everything you're doing is towards the attainment. Again, of the word dream. obsession. You've seen people obsessed with things. Uh, uh, fashion brand, mm -hmm. alcohol, food. Isn't that all they do all the time? Mm -hmm. Because that's what they're obsessed about. Absolutely. They have any small change, they're going to shop. You know, they're going shopping or they're going drinking on a binge mm -hmm. because they're obsessed by it. Again, if you're obsessed by your desire, you will find a way to make it work. I also realize, I mean, this could be slightly metaphysical. I don't know, I'm not an expert. If you want something and you throw everything into it, like you do what you're supposed to do, all this thing we have spoken about, I think sometimes the universe is just going to bring it to you. Mm. I think so. Because mm. I've had moments where I felt like I walk into opportunity. Absolutely. But God knows it's been in my heart. It's been in my soul. And I've made moves to make it happen. I've done everything within my power to be in that situation, which I am now. And when that moment happened, I feel like, oh my God, I'm, that's a bit of luck. You leave the rest. Yeah, you it's know. not luck. Yeah, but I feel yes. like something happened somewhere. I yes. feel like something connected each other. Absolutely. Yeah. It's like they say, the, the harder you work, the luckier you become, right? I think, that, I think those things need to be fleshed out. Yes. People need to realize these things look like mysticism, mm -hmm. but there's a science around it. Absolutely. Yeah, because I found myself within my 
company where I felt like people had a meeting for my benefit. Mm. Like they just said, you know what? Let's give Peter a big break. And I'm sure that's not what happened. But I've just had people doing whatever, whatever they were supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And I've been a benefactor of that. But God knows in my heart and soul, the obsession, the desire, the effort that I've made, every little subtle moves just to put myself in that situation where those opportunities will find me. And find me, they did. Amazing, amazing. Brilliant stuff. So yeah, let's kind of go back to, you know, you found this guy. He was, you know, getting this with the kind of grants from the government. And you realize, actually, I can, I can do, do that. this for myself. Yes. Yeah. So I set up this organization and I, I was making this uh, um, uh, pitch. And I just decided I'm going to play to my strength. So uh, African Film Festival, UK. Let's Let's put Nollywood on the map. Let's speak to independent black filmmakers. Let's gather each other together and make films and short documentaries and show it to our community. Let's tell our own stories ourselves. You know, I used to like, well, I still do, criticize Nigerian movie industry perpetually <laughs> for bad storytelling and whatnot and how they needed to improve. So it's like, let's have a workshop where we can analyze Nollywood, say what's wrong. And how does it get to where it needs to be, like Afrobeat? Mm. You know, those kind of events. And I realized there's help everywhere because there's a drive for inclusion. There's a drive for diversity. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to be the face of diversity in this city of Manchester. So I started to join all these uh, groups, you know, Greater Manchester, BME community, met friends. People would help me put my organization together. And then at some point, I, I had an aspiration to be a local counselor. I thought, ooh, that would be nice. Being a local counselor would be nice. As I was getting closer, I was feeling better with myself. My soul and myself were no longer at war mm. because my soul was liking the experiences I was having. Mm. And all of a sudden, I'm wearing a shirt and a blazer mm. and decent pair of shoes. Mm. And I'm having to go to places where I have to speak and speak slightly eloquently because of the audience that's there. What did that represent to you wearing, because you, you, know, you said that with a lot of pride, wearing your shirt, your yeah, suit. Yeah. What did that represent to you? It just felt like I needed to do myself some justice. You know, I needed to feel that need to be a success. I don't want to be a deadbeat dad. Mm. You know, I don't want to be the person that my relatives are ashamed of. Mm. I want them to be proud of me. I want them to say, that's my relative. Mm. Do you see what I mean? And that was the driving force for me. Plus, my economics, it needed to improve for the love of God. I want to be able to go on holiday and not come back like, oh my God, I spent all my money. What am I going to do now? Mm. I want to be able to do that and then come back and carry on with my life. Mm. And if, God forbid, somebody from my family needed some help, I wanted to be in a position where I can support them and help them. And if my daughter wanted something done or my son needed something done, or my missus needs something done. I wanted to be able to be there. Mm. So these are the things that were pushing me. But in terms of how I felt, I started to feel better in my soul. You have to listen to that inside more than anything else. You really have to listen. I don't know whether it's from here or it's from here, but you have to pay attention. How you feel is important. Whatever life decision we make, how we're feeling inside. So on paper, it may be like, Guy, what are you talking about? Come on, look at it. If it doesn't feel right inside, you have to listen. You know, so I've been in situations where it looked senseless to walk out of things on paper. But yet, yeah, this thing saying to me, you need to go. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it started feeling less conflict. I started feeling less conflict from the inside. I started feeling happy with myself and my soul. And the better I got, the more confident I became. Mm. The more confident I became, the more I'm able to gravitate. It's incredible, this thing they call um, law of attraction. Mm. You will attract what you want. And I think that goes into how you choose spouses. Mm -hmm. What you want will find you. Mm. It's incredible how these things work. I'm living the... Ev Listen, I can, there's evidence. Mm. Because the sort of people that would now gravitate towards me and become my friends are the sort of people that I want in my life mm. to help my career. So I have like a little um, close-knit network of friends within my establishment. 
every single one of these people are beneficiary. Mm. And it's not like I went shopping for them. Mm. I found them. They are close to me. You attracted them to yourself. But each one of these people brings so much value Mm. to my life. It's unbelievable. Either in terms of protection, you know, or to guide me Mm -hmm. career-wise, like, "Mm, go there, Mm. you know, or to have a good word for me, to be like, I tell you what, and then all of a sudden there's an email, I, X, this is Peter, Mm. he has these ideas, I thought you might find it interesting, Mm. and all of a sudden that conversation has changed, you know, and it's like, this is how the universe works, and this is where you will need to figure things out, you know. And so when I went to New York and I was speaking to like colleagues from CBS, CNN, Al Jazeera, ABC, there was like my heart was racing so quickly because mm. I felt like, ooh, I'm about to move to the Champions League now. Mm. Do you know what I mean? I've come yeah. from the Premier League. Mm. This is the NBA now, mm. you know, to the point that when we didn't win the award, I felt so disappointed, almost, you know, like, almost like a sense of entitlement. Mm. I, I felt so angry, like, what? And I, when I woke up the next morning, it was funny. I'm like, can you imagine? What's wrong with me <laughs> getting angry that I didn't win the Emmys? I'm in New York. <laughs> in Manhattan, on the red carpet, like, silly. Mm. But again, it, I got caught up in that joyful moment mm. where I felt like the forces had aligned. But it all came from just that little hunger mm. that I felt like I, I, I deserve to have that dream and or that aspiration for myself to be a success, you know, to do, at least to do, the, to do the best within my power. Mm. Whatever happens, happens. But can I at least know I give it a good fight? Which is what I mean. So that when I die, I die empty. I will have done everything there is possible to do. Absolutely. Yeah, totally. Absolutely. Me and my colleagues, we call that... Um, unlocking the next level you've unlocked a new level it's like a game right everything's like well, we like to gamify stuff i think so, so now you've unlocked a new level totally. the level of expectations is not completely changed right so it's like well i am an emmy winner mm. that's the level now that's the standard and if i don't win that totally. emmy, i'm disappointed yeah <laughs> right even so. when i think about it it's like i want to like douse myself with water like <laughs> wake up uh, wake up wake up, wake up. <laughs> <laughs> Mira is just is incredible, you know, uh, and it's funny. These things are like learned behavior, mm. you know. And I think as human beings, we just need to come to terms with we have to evolve, yes. we have to improve. But one thing I do know, you, there's one. Uh, I I say one strategy is. You just have to be really good at what you do, or at least apply yourself to it. Make the effort to be good at that thing that you do and try your best. For me, what I get from that is confidence. Mm. It's, it, it does my soul good because God forbid in a team of 12 or 10, God forbid I'm the weakest link. Mm. I would not be able to live with myself. Just what I mean. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. As long as I'm not the weak link or the one that they can get rid of, that's my concern every day. So for me, I try my best so that whatever happens, happens. So what that does is it gives you confidence so that even if you do leave, you know you can go somewhere because you've got the skills. Mm. And that way you're not playing some card or moaning or complaining. Mm. This is what I mean. I say, yeah, it's because, no, we're saying put yourself in a situation where you're formidable. And that's my guiding principle every time I wake up. What do I do today that's going to help me slightly more formidable so I can achieve these goals that I'm chasing? That's amazing. That's amazing. Because I've heard um, Jim Rohn, right? And he says... When you want to get success, if you want to change your life, if you're working for someone at the moment, work hard on yourself, then you work on the job. Because a job will pay you an income, but you pay yourself a fortune, right? Mm. And that's the difference because once you've not honed that skill, once you're mm. crafting and you're working yourself every single day, yeah. you know, then you can go anywhere. Yeah. It doesn't but even, really matter. But even working for your establishment. Yes. It's good for you. Absolutely. They may be making benefits, thinking they're using you. Not at all, because you're gaining skills, but you're also learning how it's done. Mm. Just what I mean. And you're getting paid to do it. Yeah. <laughs> and then you're mastering how it's done. Goodness me. Radio, which is what I've been doing now for the BBC. Radio. Radio is like my baby. Do you see what I mean? Mm-hmm. But every time I try to do my work better, I'm getting extra more skills. Mm. I could just do bare as minimum. 
and thinking, yeah, they don't pay me enough. That's a disservice to me. Mm. Never mind them. That's really that's my that's at my expense because I really need to throw myself into it so I get good stuff out mm. of it. And then they have this habit where they train you. Whatever they're giving you, I'm taking it. Mm. Do you see what I mean? Sometimes it's a bit of a stress, like, oh God, but I need these things. Do you see what I mean? So mm. they may be making gains from it where you're working hard, whatever. But for me, it's my benefit because it gives me so much confidence. It gives me so much capacity. Whatever decision I make in the future, I have those. That is so, that is so, so, so powerful. And if people could just understand that, just yeah. understand that, right? I actually heard someone talking the Black History Month from Emmanuel Sukwo, who I think we're going to be having on this gracefully in the next couple of weeks. And he, he pretty much touched on that because it's about you're working for this firm, but it's literally like an apprenticeship yeah. and you're getting a full-time wage doing it and you're going there and you're going, oh, so that's how you generate leads. Oh, so that's how you create that. Oh, so that's how you do that. Okay. Yeah. And you're doing it. You're doing it. And they're paying you to do this. And you're just gathering all of this information, yeah. all the skills. Yeah. You know, but oftentimes what happens is people yeah. go into this environment yeah. and because we've got the worker's mindset, yeah. you're going, oh, no, they're not paying me to yeah, do that. They don't that. pay me. No, that's beyond my pay grade. Mm. Just what I mean. Mm. I mean, because I've been there. When I had these deadbeat jobs that I've been talking about, I do the barest minimum because mm. I don't want to be here. Mm. You know, and I'm thinking, you don't even pay me well enough. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And I realized that that was, that was a missed opportunity, you know, because not everybody's going to be entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. A lot of us are going to be employees. Absolutely. You know, and again, I always go to the sports analogy. We mentioned all these amazing athletes. Somebody is paying their salary. <laughs> but the reason why they are so good, they're working hard for the employees. Let's say Cristiano Ronaldo, as an example, every time he tries his best and helps Man United win, they're grateful. But he's working 10 times harder than everyone. Mm. But um, is he not benefiting tremendously by being the man that he is? Absolutely. Hasn't that elongated his career? Of course, his sponsorship deals. Sponsorship deals because every time he scores, yes, the team wins, but is personal anything brand. lost on him? Personal brand. And we just need to bring that attitude into personal life, personal goals, relationship goals. Uh, you know. And I feel like we owe ourselves also to be kind to each other. And that's why you know when we're having all these challenges, you know, we need to also be nice to each other. You know, I used to like beat myself down constantly and now I'm changing. Mm. I'm trying to be nice to myself. What do you mean? Because you know, we're our own worst enemies. When you watch back the edit of this, of this uh, uh, film, you might say, oh, I don't like that. Mm. Before anybody criticizes you, Brian, mm. you will have already criticized yourself. Yeah. Like, oh my God, look at this posture, da, da, da. And I do that a lot. And a lot of us do that where we, we are hard on ourselves. Yes. And we're hard on our loved ones too, you know. And I've decided I really need to be mindful of those things where I want to be kind to myself because the world is already, everything is hard. Do you know what I mean? And wow. I don't want to continue because there's grief everywhere. There's grief at work. There's grief. We're chasing it. You know, we're trying to get over, you know, break that glass ceiling. There's so much we have to deal with. I, I need to be nice to myself. And I've realized how you treat yourself is how people will treat you. Wow. That's, wow. that's something I've noticed. That is so powerful, 100%. Yeah. You go show yourself a lot of kindness, a lot of love. Yeah, yeah. Um, but but you're right. You We're always the first to actually criticize ourselves. Totally. So, you know, be hard on yourself and all of that sort of stuff. But, yeah. you know, when you're looking at where you're coming from, where you are now, actually, you know, sometimes it's nice, you know, to give yourself that pat on the back and say, okay, you know what, congratulations, well done, yeah. and just keep keep going, really. I mean, I mean, I hated where I was. But mm -hmm. when I look about, when I think back now, mm -hmm. it's just made me resilient. Amazing. To the, um, to the point that no, nothing nothing and i say this hand on heart with most sincerity nothing can face me absolutely nothing not money worries not job security whatever happens to me i know in my heart and soul that i'm going to be fine wow. either i'm going to go find another job or i'm going to set up something or i'm going to go into some other field or some people are going to have to do whatever they have to do but you have to sort me out. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah. I'm going to have to go find some gig that I'm going to do. But there's no chance I'm going to be down and out. Brilliant. Because I've already I've been there. You've done it. You've, you've yeah. got a t-shirt. And right? then I'm not afraid anymore mm. to be on the floor. Absolutely. I was there. Yeah. So what that does is, you know, all those things like muscle memory. So when those things happen, boo, 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 I remember. 
that have been there before. And then, boom, I've learned you have to be calm and then your creative center takes over. Mm. Like, guy, what are we going to do? What's the next step? Let's call Ibrahim really quickly. I know. I'm going to send Ibrahim a quick WhatsApp message. Mm. Aha, okay, let's do this. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Because that's the only way. Whenever you have a problem, your creative juices take over. There's no clarity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There's a state of panic, which... Totally, and yeah. so me, I never panic. The first thing is... <sighs> okay. Yeah, so I have to breathe. And once I do that, I've realized that no, I need to think now. This is when I need to think. Mm. Because I cannot afford to let my brain shut down. Because this problem needs to be solved mm. ASAP. Are we fighting or are we flying? Mm. Am I running or am I facing it? Mm. Dead on. Quick, think, think, think. And I take pride in the fact that I take time off to think a lot. That's amazing. Yeah. So how did you? How did you then? So you've got this. Is was it like an NGO when you was? Yes. So I'm um, the NGOs and stuff. So you guys were you were you were actually creating pieces of work. So for well, I'll tell you one of my work is online. Yeah. I made a documentary uh, for. I call it. They call it oral history. Okay. I got a. I got a funding from Heritage Lottery Fund to make a documentary of, to, to document the oral history of Nigerians from the 1940s to the 1960s. Wow. And we had some amazing stories. Wow. Stories of the days of no blacks, no dogs. Mm. Those days, mm. people didn't realize, people forgot there was a time when Britain was like that. Mm. And there was this man, may his, may his soul rest in peace, he died now. Mine was the only interview he did on camera, and I have it, you know. And it's in the People's History Museum in Manchester. Wow. So basically, he reminisced about one of the times when he went to find a house somewhere in Manchester. And they threw hot water on his head from the top and he scalded his head. Wow. And he said, that's the injury to tomorrow. Then he had another memory about when the war was on. And he had met a young lady who was impregnated by some of the soldiers. And because it was taboo at the time, her family disowned her. So he took her in and she became his girlfriend, so to speak. White, young lady, but pregnant and she had no clue. I think maybe one of the soldiers raped her, whatever. Anyway, so they became a family and then she was due to have another baby, his baby now. But then the little girl that she had who was white only knew him as dad. So he was taking her on an outing I think she was having a moment where she was crying mm -hmm. and the locals thought that it was up to no good mm -hmm. with the baby and beat into a coma, not realizing that that's his child. Wow. Incredible stories that you wouldn't believe, people's oral history. And my dad and my mom came also in the late 50s and they had their stories. So I filmed them as well. You know, and my uncle who's, who's done some amazing things here, he's actually recognized by the queen, he has an MBE. I interviewed him and he told me his stories as a young man in the 60s, growing up in London, cleaning the trains, and then going to college. Amazing stuff. So I got paid to do that. Wow. So I realized creativity is all you need. Mm. Ideas rule the world. I absolutely had fun doing that bit. So they gave me cash. I bought cameras and everything. I conceived the idea. I, I took trains across England. I interviewed people, and I made a nice documentary, and we watched it, and I had a massive round of applause. And they put it on their website. How did that feel? It felt great. Because I had fun throughout. This is what I'm trying to say. Mm. Just imagine that. Going from working in a care home. And as a security guard. Freezing. Mm. I've had moments when people have tried to beat me up. When mm. I used to be a bouncer. I remember a time somebody grabbed me by the scruff of my coat. His forehands were so big. You know, I was trying to slap his hand down. They didn't move. They just grabbed me like that. Because a girl had accused him of something. And I was like, excuse me. And he just took offense that this security guy, this skinny, tall guy, <laughs> had the temerity to speak to him. And he just grabbed me by the, by the throat and took me to the back door and just launched me. So I've had all these moments, you know what I mean? And then all of a sudden, I'm making documentaries for uh, Heritage Lottery Fund. And they put it on their website with my little face. Wow. That was amazing. Mm. And I realized... Sometimes you just need ideas and then you need to believe in your, in your dreams. Mm. So that was my gig. And then I got into the European Union. There was a project called Erasmus where you're a youth, youth worker for young people. 
I went to Latvia, uh, uh, Lithuania, Hungary, Germany, Romania. I went to Transylvania to Dracula's castle. I was in his bedroom. I'm like, this is, my life is good. <laughs> Do you see what I mean? People were paying for those flights. Yeah. The European <laughs> Union was paying for that. And I was just going as a youth worker. We would do like uh, uh, capacity building, uh, how to write CVs, how to, how to do diversity, interreligious conversation, because this was where my strength lied. Mm. It was great. And then I came back on one of my trips and I saw a message from the BBC. Oh, we're offering you a job because I'd applied to work in the BBC. I'd applied to work in the home office as an immigration officer. Wow. I'd applied to work in the police because my soul and I had become friends now. And I'm beginning to do what my spirit told me that I could do as against, don't be daft, do what is feasible. So you even had the audacity now to actually apply for the BBC? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something I would never dream of before. I just felt like, why not? You know, because there was a time I worked in a community radio station mm. where they don't pay you. Mm. You come there for free. You pay for your own fare. And God forbid you make any mistake, you still get in trouble even though they're not paying you. Mm. But it was nice. So I found my voice. All of a sudden, I'm speaking on the microphone. I'm playing Two-Face, Edibia. I'm playing. There was no Bernard Boy or Davido at the time. <laughs> the Banj. I was playing the Banj. Mm. I was playing too. I, was, I loved it. I would just waffle through. But I was just hitting it with Afrobeat. So when I look at all the Afrobeat DJs on One Extra, now I'm thinking, I used to do that mm. before you guys. And it was then that I felt like, I can, I can, this journalism thing, I can, I can bring this dream back again. I was well into my 40s. Uh, true story. True story. The class of uh, fresh employees that came in with me, they thought I was one of the bosses. Because we we're supposed to meet our bosses. Yes. I think they employed 20 of us that year. And we all met each other for the first time. Of course, I wore my... That must have been a sharp suit, I was course, about to yeah. say. <laughs> of course, I wore, my, I wore my Christmas blazer. My shoes were sparkling. So I think they thought one of the bosses came early. Yes. And no, it's not one of the bosses. It's you. Because, I mean, these guys were in their 20s, late 20s. I was mm. well into my 40s when I eventually turned that corner. And now that I've turned that corner, it's like, it's all guns blazing. Wow. That's, that's absolutely phenomenal. Because what, what I've kind of taken out of that is you, you come into this country in a situation that you didn't really expect yourself to be. You know, you're going down this journalistic route, which has always been your route from when you were young. Mm. Right? And then I had to stop. Boom. Bang. And reality hit. And I went on. to the dust. Yes. Yeah. You know, but the, but the vision never died. Even though your mind never tried died. to control you, yeah. the vision, My soul there was something. Refused, yeah. yes. It kept saying to me, you, you, you can do way more. I'm convinced, but sometimes I used to feel like I was just foolish mm. and arrogant because there's no evidence to suggest that I can, you know, until I had that moment. You just, I just needed one little success. And then, you know what they say, when it rains, it pours. Yes. From one thing to the other. So I just kept going that way. That but way. That, was, that was keeping the vision alive, though, because, you know, the facts are, if that dream had died, you had an opportunity... It was, you know, youth working, you know, working with vulnerable people, all that sort of stuff. That's what this guy was doing. Mm. But because the dream was still alive, you understood that you could get funding. Yeah. And actually, now yeah. I can start creating pieces of yeah. work, yeah. you know, that, yeah. that that's going to give me joy, that yeah. I'm going to love doing. Totally. And that dream all of a sudden yeah. comes to life. Yeah, totally. And then you go and do it. You start to feel confident. Yeah. You start to feel like yeah. this is actually what I want to do again. Totally. You know what? Why can't I work for the BBC? Yeah. Uh, and then you're actually going to make the application. Yeah. So just that power of keeping that yeah. dream alive, never dying, and then, importantly, taking those actions yeah. to actually go and bring that dream to reality, yeah. then all of a sudden things start to compound yeah. and things start to align for yeah. you, right? I say also we have to lose the fear of failure. Mm. Yeah. yeah. I think I, I read somewhere, or did, or did I watch a clip of somebody saying you need to fail often? You know, yes. or get get fail familiar. Often, fail forward. Fail forward. Yes. Just be familiar with it so that it doesn't scare you. Yeah, I think it was Will Smith. Yes. So throw everything into it, mm -hmm. but don't be afraid to fail because even by not trying, it means you already fail. So I'm a trier. You know, um, I've, I've had people say to me, "What have you not done?" I'm like, "That's true. I've tried <laughs> everything. I, stand, I I try stand up comedy once. Why not? So, yeah. So when I watch Trevor Noah, I watch Basket Mouth. Mm -hmm. and all these big comedians 
in my little corridor, <clears throat> in my happy place where I go. I have a lot of compartments in my brain, by the way, where I go. I go to places where I tell myself the honest truth and make difficult decisions about adjustments I need to make in my life. Mm -hmm. Then I go to a place where I indulge myself with happy thoughts. Mm. Anyway, then I go to a place of memory where I remember where I'm coming from. I've had moments where when I watch those things, I go to the happy place and I see, I know in my heart that if I wanted to be a comedian now, mm. I could be a success. I could make a success of it because I'd done it before wow. at, um, at, the at the club scenes without really having this habit that I have now or mm. this thought process, mm. just trying to see my talent if it's going to hold on. Mm. And I've had some success. I also feel like if I wanted to be a filmmaker, to go into Nollywood proper, I could find success there. Mm. Do you know what I mean? But right now that I'm a journalist, I absolutely love it. Working for the BBC. When I wake up in the morning, there's joy mm. that I'm going to work. Just what I mean. Yes. And it's a happy place, but I'm also aware that I'm in a comfort zone. So I'm making the decision to continue to push myself to where I can continue to go out. So I, I went from the Africa service, which is like back of my hand, Nigeria, come on, what are you going to say, Boko Haram, hmm? anything that's happening in Nigeria, so I'm, I'm across it, so now I'm, I'm off to the business desk, which is pushing me, mm. now I need to pay attention to taxation, mm. forex, midterms, you know. Uh, Why is that uh, important to push yourself? Why I, just, you just... I just feel like growth, is, is where, that's where you'll find growth, when you continue to push yourself, is where you'll find the growth. I'm, I'm very afraid of comfort zone. Mm. Yeah, as What's much as that? I want comfort. Because I feel like when you stay too long, you're going to get shoved out. Because some hungry lions are going to come from behind you. Mm. They're going to be younger and they're going to be hungrier. Mm. So for you, it's become second nature because you're comfortable. It's a comfort zone for a reason. Mm. But because they are hungrier, they'll go the extra mile. Then they'll shove you off. Mm. And then it's too late because mm. you've lost opportunities to go elsewhere. And you, now you are too big for here. Mm. Where are you going to go now? Mm. And when I think about it, it scares me. Wow. Yeah, and I've seen, I've seen that happen to people and, where, and where they get shoved out of their comfort zone. Really? And that's where that fear is important because they say feel the fear and do it anyway. Totally. Right? But that's where that, that really comes important because first of all, you can't be courageous without being fearful. Totally. Right? So like feeling that fear keeps you not on edge, but it, it keeps you wanting more. It keeps you more eager. It keeps you more hungry because you're like, okay, cool, there's... Because at the other end of failure, like I think this is Will Smith who said this as well. He said, God has placed the best things in life on the other side of fear. Uh -huh. Aha. <laughs> that makes so much sense. Because going back to my documentary, everything came off that documentary. I yes. was supposed to, be, I, I investigated a criminal organization. People lose their lives doing mm. that. And the, the fear is still imminent even as we speak yeah incredible Just, yeah i'm talking still, about this is the documentary that you actually got nominated for the emmys for that one yeah you know wow but black the, axe right black axe yeah but yes. the process was really it was quite scary so in my mind i'm this confident guy until you get to where you see fear mm. then you realize you're actually a scary cat i was so afraid for my life through other process. Can you tell us a bit more about that documentary? Because I actually, you know, we, we connected at, uh, at a, a world festival, global world festival that we both went to. And I was like, yes, I need to speak to this guy because you came on stage and... Why did you feel like you needed to speak to me? Because you were different, right? This was like a global world festival and, you know, everyone that was there, it was... I was angry. Yes, I, your energy. There was so much anger. Your in energy my tone. was just so different, right? Yeah. And I was like, "Wow!" And and everything you were saying resonated with me, right? So I was like, who, "I need to speak to this person," yeah. right? So I just, I, that's why I came to connect with you. Like, sure. why did you feel how you felt that way? And why did you speak so um, passionately that day? I was, yeah, there was a bit of anger because for me, when I see the community of black people, I feel like it's about time we need to start doing things properly. Mm -hmm. Just what I mean. And I feel like religious um, stuff, religious habit, it does hold us back to a degree. Mm -hmm. So I thought that the purpose of why we gathered was to share nuggets of how we're going to go from A to B with success. Somebody used to make jokes like if you ask Warren Buffet how he made his money, he'll tell you what he did. 
If you ask Elon Musk, it will tell you what he did. If you ask a Nigerian person, you say it's God. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's like, can we at least give each other details? Mm. So when I thought about the fact that people paid to come there, you know, because initially I was like, listen, we need to do A, B, and C. And I think when one of the um, uh, contributors was talking and then it was all about scripture and obedience, and I'm thinking, oh, what? The, so I got really flustered. Mm. So I'm thinking, can we not do this here? Mm. And I think that's what pushed me because I just felt like, please, can we have details mm. of what people need to do? Mm. You know, because when you go back to work on Monday and Amanda has the job that you're trying to get, mm. Or Alex as the role that you're looking for. Don't start saying it's racism. Mm. Because why only God knows what Alex has done and Amanda behind the scene to put that make themselves ready. Mm. That's why we're here. Can you give us this nugget so we can go and become better competitors competitors? Because it's a jungle out there. And I think that's that's what happened to me that day, you know. So well, it was great, you know, me kind of listening to the message, it really struck me here, and you know, and that's why I connected with yourself straight away. So thank you for putting that message thank you. out. Thank you. Brilliant stuff. Brilliant. So um, just kind of going back to the black cactus, I really want us to touch on, yes. touch on that a little bit. Yes. So um, the documentary was about this uh, criminal gang from Nigeria. They, didn't, they never used to be that. It was like a sorority club. Well, almost like just like an organization that was trying to fight injustice within the society it was, it was set up in the times of the colonials, and they just wanted equality, equity, justice, fairness, but a group of university students. And I think sometime in the 90s, it went rogue, where it just became this haven of violence and just gangs, really, gang violence, except it now took it to another level where it became like a syndicate of human trafficking, rape, murder, you know, uh, fraud so i was just able to kind of uh, bring them out in the open and tell the story which is not necessarily new to most nigerians but the globe did not know the enormity no, of it i felt like it was you know because me watching that and seeing the level of exposure like you really expose yourself you put Proper. yourself in you know people who don't know about these places right you put yourself in a position where you can't just get in the car and drive out if there's no, a problem no i mean we, when we went to makoko yeah makoko we yeah. traveled on 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 the in the on the canoe on water filled with fe human feces and needles and you don't want to fall into that water mm -mm. you're not going to come out healthy <laughs> just what i mean and that's the only way we can access that place mm -hmm. and exit so everything has to go well. Everything has to go well. We have to do everything within our power to live. Yet we have come to ask difficult questions. How do you do that? How do you ask difficult questions and hope to live safely? Mm -hmm. Then we also had the elements that we didn't prepare for, like the uh, um, rival gangs mm -hmm. could ambush them at any time because that's what happens a lot. They ambush each other and kill each other. Mm -hmm. We might be there at the wrong time, you know, because... We, did, we, we thought about that, but you just have to go. No, no one's planning for a camera exactly, crew to be there. Yeah. They've got their plans, you've got yours. Totally. And also, what if these boys don't really appreciate the line of questions? Mm. and they Because they're quite, you know. So what if they get really angry and turn on us or kidnap us? That happens a lot in the, in the country. Mm -hmm. What if they see my Caucasian colleague and, and see money? And they kidnap the two of us. Mm. It's super easy because there's water anyway. We can't leave. And then send uh, ransom notes to our families or whatever. There's so much danger. And that's when I realized like how much of a scary cat I really am. Because in my mind, when it was like, let's do it, I'm like, let's go. Again, you know, I already desired this moment. So when it happened, when the conversation was being had, I saw that that was my moment. You know, because I've been obsessed with trying to do these things. So mm. as soon as the chat was going in that direction, I jumped on it. Like, this is my moment. I'm taking it. Wow. So I wasn't really thinking about the dangers as mm. much. But when we got on set, it dawned on me. Like, I might have beaten <laughs> more than I could chew. So it was a bit, it was, uh, yeah, it was nerve-wracking. But you know what? You know, like we said, best things in life on the other side of fear. And as totally. a result of you pushing through that fear, grabbing the opportunity in the moment of the opportunity, totally. you know, it's it's not elevated you to a whole different level. Like so I said, I literally turned the corner. 
you know, Grayson um, nomination, you know, Amy Awards nomination. This is absolutely incredible. And, um, you know, I'm really, really, really honoured for you to actually come Thank and you grace so your much. presence I've, today. I've had a great time. Brilliant. But we've not finished yet. We <laughs> have not finished yet. Because you've not had, you know, this great success and a phenomenal story from where you started as a security guard to now you're being nominated at the very, very highest level of your craft. So today, Mr. Bolaha, Peter McJob, what is your need to succeed? Oh, that's interesting. Like, so almost like what is my need now since I seem to have gotten what I'm looking for? Absolutely. I think the need to stay. I think the need not to fall back to where I was coming from mm. is my need to succeed now. And I realize it's a classic uh, moment of you cannot rest on, on the oars. Just what I mean. So I've done that. So it would be wrong to now do that mm. because the move, the, the boat will stop. Mm. And God, God forbid I go back to where I was before. I will not be able to handle that. So I've realized I cannot wait. Maybe not as frantic as I was before, but I need to just make it steady. So that's my need to succeed right now to keep this pace going because I really, really like it versus how the, my life was before. I like the way it is right now. You know, I don't think... Ibrahim would invite me to a podcast 10 years ago. And if I look at myself 10 years ago, it's a bit of an embarrassment. They feel like, come on, man. Like, come on, man. Like, come on, do something with yourself. Was the man. This dude now, I like him better. You see what I mean? And so I prefer that. So that's my need to succeed now. I cannot afford to go back to mediocre or average. I really want to do something phenomenal with my life and by extension do something phenomenal for my family amazing stuff Mr. Bella and Peter <laughs> McJob thank you very much thank you so much awesome man <laughs> that was, that was, was it good <laughs>